The Mughal period is one of the longest and most well-known phases in the history of the Indian subcontinent. Last episode described the arrival of the Mughals in India. This episode will cover the next four to five years of Indian history and will educate viewers about the Mughal consolidation in the Indian subcontinent. The references primarily used in the preparation of this documentary were the biography of Mughal Emperor Babur and that of his descendants Humayun and Akbar. Central Asian king of the Timurid dynasty, Babur, was the ruler of Kabul in modern-day Afghanistan. Using Kabul as his base, he had launched campaigns in the Indian subcontinent. His multiple invasions of Punjab has pitted him against the Delhi-based Lodi Empire. The Lodi king, Sultan Ibrahim Lodi, had attempted to drive him away from Punjab. Lodi and Babur's armies met at Panipat that led to a huge conflict. The battle ended fatally for the Lodi king that gave Babur a decisive victory. Before we find out what Babur did after the Battle of Panipat, let us have a look at the political situation of India at the time. Lodi Empire was not the only Indian power. There were several other kingdoms that were capable of fighting the Mughals. One of those was the Rajput Confederacy, then known as Rajputana. It is the modern-day Rajasthan. The ancestors of Rajput kings were Indians, and thus they claimed to be the natives of the subcontinent. One quality that the Rajputs were known for was their courage. They would never come back defeated from the battlefield. Embracing death in a battle was no less honorable to a Rajput than a glorious victory. Until this point, the kings of Delhi were never able to conquer Rajputana. Divided into numerous kingdoms, the most prominent one was Mewar, although it does not cover much area in the map, it includes the more agriculturally productive regions that help to generate much greater revenues than the other states of Rajputana. The king of Mewar was a highly renowned figure in the Indian history. Rana Sangha was an exceptional leader and had very cordial relations with all the kingdoms of Rajputana. Since becoming the king in 1509, he had taken the fortunes of Mewar to the greatest heights. He had lost an eye and a leg in one of the previous battles, and the Rajputs 
saw him as a symbol of courage and bravery. Most historians agree to the fact that Rana Sangha was the face of Rajputana at that point. Rana Sangha belonged to the Sisodia dynasty and his ancestors controlled large parts of the Indian subcontinent in their times. Rana Sangha lived up to the legacy. He promoted political unity in Rajputana to be better able to fend off external invasions. His residence, Fort Chittorgarh, was the tallest in India and was nearly unpenetrable. In his attempt to unify Rajputana, he believed in involving all the Rajput kingdoms in his campaigns against a common enemy. He recently launched campaigns against the Gujarat Sultanate and the Sultanate of Malwa, alongside other Rajput states. Healthy distribution of the gains of victory among all of Rajputana had the effect of turning Rajputs into a cohesive unit. While Babur had clashed with the Lodi Empire, Rana Sangha and his Rajput allies might have imagined a prolonged war between the two powers. When they learned of the decisive Mughal victory at Panipat, they held a conference to discuss their future options. Babur's ancestor Timur had plundered the city of Delhi in the late 14th century, and the Tughlaq king of northern India was too weak to offer a resistance. The city was absolutely decimated, and it took Delhi a long time to restore itself to its former glory. The Rajputs might have expected Babur to take up a similar course of action. They speculated that it would be easier for Babur to loot and plunder Delhi than to rule it. That would have enabled them to expand their influence in North India. But the Rajputs were astonished when Babur proclaimed himself the emperor of the Indian subcontinent in the month of May 1526. The politics of North India has taken a dramatic turn. Now it was time for the Rajputs to carefully consider their options before deciding on a course of action. But the Rajputs were not the only prominent power in North India. The Lodi army had not been entirely destroyed at Panipat. A fraction of the Afghan army managed to escape. However, the escaping army failed to mobilize or regroup later. The Afghan army at Panipat was truly an incoherent unit. So, even while escaping, they formed their own groups. They had formed four groups that went to Agra, Gwalior, Sambhal, and Bayana.
After occupying Delhi, Babur sent Mughal troops in pursuit of those escaping Afghan soldiers of the Lodi army. The first group of pursuing Mughal soldiers besieged the Lodi army at Sambhal. The Lodi soldiers surrendered and were taken into Mughal service. This led the region of Rohil Khand to submit to Babur. Similar incident took place at Gwalior in the middle of 1526. Babur entered Gwalior to take control of the city. There, he expressed admiration for the fort of Gwalior and said that he had never seen such excellent architecture back in Kabul. Babur also went personally to Dholpur to accept the submission of the city. Avadh, Jaunpur and Benaras were taken over in the season of monsoon. Mughal troops led by Babur's eldest son Humayun occupied the major city of Agra. However, one group of escaping Lodi army managed to make a firm stand. The group reached Bayana and were joined by a Rajput division sent by Rana Sangha. While they guarded the fort, news reached them that Babur had dispatched his excellent general Tardi Beg with Mughal troops to capture Bayana. The defenders offered a gallant resistance and the Mughal troops withdrew after suffering massive casualties. This was Babur's first major setback in the Indian campaign. In the January of 1527, the escaping Lodi soldiers from Bayana went over to Rajputana to meet Rana Sangha. They had decided the only surviving adult member of the Lodi royal clan named Mahmud Lodi to be declared the rightful claimant to the Lodi throne. Mahmud Lodi was the cousin of Sultan Ibrahim Lodi, who was killed in action at Panipat. His followers, who will be referred to as the Lodi loyalists, sought military assistance from Rana Sangha to install Mahmud Lodi on the throne of Delhi. An agreement was quickly agreed at by the Lodi loyalists and the Rajput confederacy. The Rajputs would help Mahmud Lodi drive out the Mughals from Delhi while the Lodi king would have to share power with the Rajputs in North India once the Mughals are defeated. The exact terms of the agreement remain unclear, but it is likely that Mahmud Lodi would have to share, uh, beg your pardon, would have to give Agra to Rana Sangha after securing Delhi for himself. So, a formidable coalition among the major North Indian powers was taking shape against the Mughals. Various Rajput dominions had contributed a force and the kingdom of Mewar was 
to lead this coalition. Also joining the coalition was Mewat, uh, which is part of modern day Rajasthan and Haryana. The Lodi loyalists under their leader Sultan Mahmud Lodi, of course, was an integral part of this coalition. This Mewar led coalition was fast making its way eastwards towards Agra. Fort after fort surrendered, unable to withstand the Rajput gallantry. Mughal commanders fled eastwards to Agra, failing to weather the storm. The Rajput takeover of Ra beg your pardon, the Rajput takeover of Agra looked like a matter of time. This is the first time that Babur's abilities would be put to the ultimate test in the Indian subcontinent. He had the option of withdrawing to Lahore, but he had other ideas. He urged his officers to fight for the Mughal existence and dashed his wine cups to the ground, taking an oath of total abstinence till the Rajput challenge has been overcome. He had to choose a spot to counter Rana Sangha and his coalition. Babur picked Kanwa, 80 kilometers west of Agra. It is very close to modern day Bharatpur, near the eastern border of Rajasthan. Here, the ground favored the defender. Babur desperately needed this advantage as he needed to deal with the enormity of the opposing forces in addition to its fearless nature. It is said that some Rajputs did have the tradition of consuming some kind of powdered intoxicants just before a major battle. The purpose was to loosen up their mind and to get rid of any possible anxiety or fear that would enable them to embrace death with open arms if necessary. Such reckless nature of the enemy made Babur take up a defensive battle position as he resolved to stop Rana Sangha from advancing to Agra. His speech to his officers had a massive propaganda effect on the Mughals. They were convinced that their present enemy would be the ultimate test of their character and determination. The Mughal officers looked to repeat their excellent performance in Central Asia as Rana Sangha drew closer to offer them the battle of their lives. The Rajput army reached Kanva in the middle of March 1527. Rana Sangha was informed by his spies that Babur had made a stand at Kanwa. The king of Mewar was confident of taking down the Mughals. It is necessary to have a look 
at the numerical strength of the opposing forces at Kanwa. The Mughals had higher numbers than at Panipat, as the recent control of wealthy cities like Delhi, Agra, and Gwalior enabled them to enlist the services of more mercenaries. Nearly 40,000 cavalry and 20 field cannons was what Babur was equipped with. The Rajput coalition had 80,000 horses, some infantry, and 200 war elephants. On a rough note, Babur was outnumbered two is to one. The Mughal battle formation was similar to that in Panipat, but they would have two central cavalry divisions. The coalition army was arrayed in a traditional manner. Rana Sangha placed himself at the center. The Rajput kettle drums struck up early in the morning and the Rajput advanced cavalry, including the best blades of Rajputana, charged forwards towards the Mughal lines. The Mughal artillery responded with cannon fire and the Rajput horsemen had to withdraw under pressure to their original positions. Despite the artillery firing range being just around 200 meters, the animals in the coalition army were not familiar with the sound of cannon fire. They became wayward and were proving difficult to control. So the Rajput war elephants were moved back as a precautionary measure. Rana Sangha realized that the artillery was providing a natural defense to the Mughal center. He could not attack head-on. So he ordered his cavalry units to charge at the Mughal wings. While advancing, the Rajput cavalry had to wheel their way around to prevent being in the range of the Mughal artillery. This was an evenly contested phase of the battle. The Rajputs tried to exert pressure on their enemy by the virtue of their superior numbers while the Mughal wings held out thanks to their defensive positions. Casualties were high on either side, higher for the Rajputs. This phase of the battle lasted for three hours. The Rajput horses finally withdrew to their original positions to be able to regroup and strike harder. There was silence on the battlefield for some time. Neither side wanted to do anything silly. It was then Barber who assumed the offensive. Like at Panipat, he tried outflanking maneuver. His right and left wing cavalry charged the enemy left and right respectively. 
The Rajputs countered this assault with courage and confidence. Babur soon realized that he did not have enough numbers to encircle the enemy. The Mughal horses were called back. Babur was waiting for the Rajputs to make a mistake. But no aggression came from Rana Sangha's forces. So, Babur tried a diversionary attack. Only around 2,000 of his cavalrymen charged at the Rajput flanks with the intention of luring a large part of the enemy force away from their positions. That might open up gaps in the Rajput army which could then be exploited by the Mughals. However, the Rajputs were smart soldiers. They did not quit their positions under the challenge, so Babur had to call back his men once again. By this point, both sides had taken massive casualties with no ground gained. Desiring to put an end to the deadlock, the Mewat cavalry tried their hand at glory. Under the leadership of their king Hassan Khan Mewati, the Mewat cavalry charged at the enemy lines without an approval from Rana Sangha. They braved the enemy artillery fire and fell on the advance Mughal center. This was a critical moment in the battle. If the advance Mughal center had given way or withdrawn under pressure, big gaps would have been created in the Mughal army. The Rajputs then would have driven home the advantage with their superior numbers. However, this part of the Mughal army was composed of veterans of the Uzbekistan wars. They withstood the enemy onslaught with courage and, despite suffering a few casualties, they stood their ground like mountains. The artillery cut off the retreat of the Mewat cavalry and the intruders found themselves trapped. Encircled from all sides by Babur's men, the Mewat cavalry was soon annihilated and ceased to exist. Despite having destroyed one component of the enemy forces, the Mughals had conceded high casualties and they were reeling under the effect of the enemy's repeated onslaught. It was then that a crucial development took place. Rajput chief Silhadi had received tempting offers from Babur that he found hard to resist. He went over to the Mughals and betrayed the cause of the Rajputs. This was probably the turning point of the battle as it forced the Rajputs to change their battle formation. The Rajputs were running out of patience. Assuming that the Mughals had run out of gunpowder, Rana Sangha ordered his advanced cavalry to try breaking through. 
However, the Mughal cannons maintained steady fire and the Rajputs had to withdraw with heavy casualties. It was at this point that Babur played his masterstroke. The advance Mughal center for the first time in the battle assumed an offensive. They fought the Rajputs for some time and then went back in apparent fear, pretending to flee the battlefield. The Rajputs fell for the trap. They proceeded to pursue the pretenders. The Rajputs were then countercharged by the rear Mughal cavalry that was kept fresh till now. The Rajputs had to withdraw after suffering massive damage. Most importantly, their leader Rana Sangha was severely injured and had to be taken away from the battlefield. There was silence on the ground for some time, seeing the tide of the battle turning against the Rajputs, Mahmud Lodi quit the field with his followers and went back to his camp. Second in command to Rana Sangha was the Rajput chief Jhala. He put on the royal insignia and took command of the Rajput army. However, he was found to lack foresight. He ordered repeated assaults on the Mughal wings. He even took men away from his center to try and force a breakthrough at the Mughal flanks. The Rajput attacks on the Mughal wings only served the purpose of mounting casualties on both sides as the men of Rajputana were not able to get the better of the Central Asian mercenaries. Babur had noticed the weak Rajput center. Although it would be a big risk, he decided to take a chance. He ordered his advance Mughal center to attack the Rajput advance cavalry and the Rajput center. The already exhausted Rajputs wavered under pressure and lost their battle formation. Seeing this, many of the prominent Rajput leaders had to rush forward and take control of the battlefield. A ferocious hand-to-hand -hand combat ensued and many prominent leaders fell on both sides. However, the death of many Rajput generals made the soldiers leaderless. Heavily confused on how to advance, the Rajputs made one desperate final charge on the Mughal wings. The Mughals were able to maintain discipline while the Rajputs perished at their hands. Had it been any other army, they would have surely retreated by now. But being a Rajput did not entitle them to that option. 
they continued to attack till the bitter end at this point their assaults lost effectiveness due to the lack of their leaders and the Mughals were easily able to beat them back. Finally, the bloody encounter came to an end. The Rajputs were too tired to charge at the enemy, while the Mughals were too exhausted to launch an offensive. With a good number of Mughals still holding their ground, the victory was claimed by Babur. The Mughals had achieved a Pirhik battlefield victory that came at a great cost. The battle lasted for nine hours. Of all the Rajputs who took part in the action, more than half sacrificed their lives. Babur lost around 7,000 men. It did take the Mughal army a few days to recover from this massive damage. The Rajput Confederacy, on the other hand, fell into a chaos after having much of their army destroyed. Babur utilized his defensive position well and was rewarded with a victory. The Rajputs, in contrast, lacked a clear strategy that cost them the battle and possibly their future as well. Rana Sangha could have taken a defensive approach at Kanva. He could have waited for the enemy advance and meanwhile sent a part of his force to take Agra by making a detour. That might have prompted Babur to divide his forces, exposing his numerical disadvantage. Historians noted that Mughal cannons prevented Rana Sangha from achieving a glorious victory. The use of Babur's field artillery in the Battle of Kanva put an end to the outdated trends of warfare in North India. The battle did have some far-reaching consequences. The annihilation of the Rajputs meant the lack of a major power in North India to challenge the Mughal supremacy. Delhi and Agra, in addition to, to the nearby regions, were now truly and firmly in Mughal hands. The Rajput Confederacy had their power shattered. They no longer continued to play a major role in the politics of the Indian subcontinent. The political unity of the Rajputs will not be a reality from now on, as various domains of Rajputana would clash against one another. Above all, it was the power and reputation of the Kingdom of Mewar that would take a massive hit. Mewar would henceforth be confined to narrow domains and 
would be exposed to external invasions in the future. Rana Sangha was not able to accept this shocking defeat. He started gathering an army to try and challenge Babur again, but he died soon after. He was possibly poisoned by the Rajput chiefs who regarded his plans of renewing conflict with the mighty Mughals as suicidal. Babur did not rest after reaching Delhi. He started crushing minor powers of North India or forcing them to submission. This would consolidate his newly found empire in 1527. One of the still formidable Rajput leaders was Medini Rao. He was a close ally of Rana Sangha and fought at the Battle of Kanwa. After the Rajput defeat, he managed to retreat and make it back to his province of Chanderi with most of his soldiers intact. Babur offered peace to Medini Rai, offering him a Jagir or region in his empire. It was declined. So, Babur started for Chanderi in central India. He reached there in the January of 1528 and laid siege to the Chanderi fort. The fort fell in a few hours and the defenders were put to the slaughter. The civilians in the fort jumped into the fire to commit Jauhar or self-immolation to avoid dishonor at the hands of the enemy. This victory helped Babur expand his influence into central India. The Lodi loyalists did not suffer much damage at the Battle of Kanwa. Their leader, Mahmud Lodi, fled to the west after hearing of the Mughal victory at Kanwa. He took refuge with the Sultanate of Gujarat. He requested military aid from the major powers within his easy reach for his future confrontation with the Mughals. But neither the Sultanate of Gujarat nor the Sultanate of Malwa wished to risk getting into confrontation with the powerful Mughals. In the middle of 1528, Babur was yet to subdue the eastern regions of the Indian subcontinent into his domain. So, Mahmud Lodi was desperately looking for support from the eastern powers. He found an ally in his brother-in-law, Nusrat Shah, king of the Sultanate of Bengal. 
Mahmud Lodi was provided refuge at the Bengali capital of Gaur in late 1528. The Kingdom of Bengal had grown powerful in the recent years and was eager to clash with the Mughals, whom they saw as a growing threat. The Sultanate of Bihar was also party to the anti-Mughal coalition for reasons that I shall discuss later. The Lodi loyalists who were the core supporters of the newly proclaimed king in exile Mahmud Lodi completed the coalition. The Lodi loyalists, of course, were looking to take power back from the Mughals in North India. The region of Bihar was earlier a part of the Lodi Empire. The governors and officers in Bihar were Lohani Patans, a different group of ethnic Afghans. In recent years, they had been able to declare independence from the Delhi rule. They had been able to use the instability in the Lodi Empire to their advantage and attain autonomy. However, the Lohani ruled kingdom of Bihar was going through a bit of instability at the moment due to the recent death of their king, Sultan Beher Khan. Lohani, who was succeeded by his nine-year-old son Jalaluddin Lohani. Sher Shah Suri, the regent of the boy king, was to be the future emperor. At this point, however, he was to be the representative of the minor sultan till when the child is old enough to assume his royal duties by himself. Sher Shah, of course, had a remarkable rise in fortunes in the past and the future, which however, is beside the point for this episode of the documentary. The Kingdom of Bihar was invited into the anti-Mughal alliance in 1528 by the Bengal Sultanate and by Mahmud Lodi himself. However, it was not an easy choice to make. The Lohani leaders of Bihar were divided in opinion and the absence of an adult ruler on the throne prevented a prompt decision. Let us discuss their considerations, beg your pardon. Uh, let us discuss their considerations in this decision making process. Bihar had the powerful Bengali kingdom as their neighbor to the east and could not afford to ignore the proposal straight away. On the other hand, joining the alliance would set them up in conflict with the mighty Mughal Empire. A Mughal defeat would not give them much advantage, and yet 
there was a compelling reason that prevented their neutrality in the upcoming war. If a Mughal Bengali clash was to happen, it was likely to take place in the domains of Bihar that lied between the two powers. A Lohani neutrality in the upcoming war would inevitably lead to a massive destruction of their resources. For this reason, they reluctantly accepted the offer from Nasrat Shah, the king of the Sultanate of Bengal. However, they were more committed to prevent their lands from getting ravaged than to defeat the Mughals. Back at Delhi in late 1528, Mughal Emperor Babur was aware of the impending coalition against him. He was well informed of the situation in the eastern parts of the Indian subcontinent. He decided to act with promptitude. Babur sent out peace offers to the Sultanate of Bengal and also to the Kingdom of Bihar. While the Sultanate of Bengal rejected the proposal outright, the Lohani ruled Bihar requested some time to arrive at a decision. Babur speculated that the Lohani leaders could be won over. To put pressure on the Eastern Kingdoms, Babur himself set out for the East with his army. Meanwhile, the Bengali army under the leadership of Sultan Nasrat Shah marched towards the west. Alongside them were the Lodi loyalists and their leader Mahmud Lodi. They were joined by the Lohani ruled Bihar army at the Bengal Bihar border. The coalition army marched towards the west and looked set to overwhelm the Mughals with their sheer numbers. The meandering river Ghagra is a tributary of the Ganges. It was on the banks of this river that the battle was to take place. The venue of the next major military engagement would be near the city of Patna. Babur reached the banks of the river in February 1529 and waited for reinforcements to arrive. The coalition army reached the location in late April and encamped there. The Mughals as in the previous battles, were outnumbered once again. The armies of Bengal and Bihar had comparable numerical strength. Their mindset, however, were remarkably different. While the Bengal Sultan and his generals were looking to deliver a brutal assault on the Mughals, the Lohani leaders of Bihar wished 
to get the battle over with the least possible bloodshed. The military engagement took place in early May 1529. The Lohani-led Bihar army in its entirety was positioned in the southern bank of the river, while most of the Bengali troops took up positions at the northern bank of Ghagra. The Lodi loyalists were at the extreme north of the coalition army. The Mughal army was arrayed in a similar fashion as the two previous major battles. The watery and swampy grounds of the eastern part of the subcontinent favored the defender. But Babur identified a piece of land that was suitable for cavalry charge. He would need it later. He had all his army on the northern bank of the river. Babur instructed his navy to find a crossing point that was unprotected by the enemy. Mughal cannons would protect Babur's army from a charge from the enemy. However, the coalition generals were happy to play the waiting game. Taking a lesson from Panipat and Kanwa, the Bengali army decided not to go for a direct charge and instead waited for the opportune moment. As the hours rolled by, neither side made a move. It appeared that both armies adopted a cautious approach to the battle. Meanwhile, Babur had a meeting with his top generals to deal with the enemy at the southern bank of the river. It was agreed that when the Mughal navy would find a passage without the enemy's knowledge, they would try and send some troops over to put pressure on the enemy. The Mughal navy initiated the activity of attempting to find a secret crossing point. Barber's generals suggested a plan for dealing with the Northern Bengali army and the lowly loyalists. The Mughal left-wing cavalry was under the able command of Ali Kuli Khan, Barber's trusted general. The general commanded around 20,000 cavalry troops. It was decided that he would launch a surprise attack on the Lodi loyalists. Ali Kuli Khan gathered his soldiers and issued them with proclamations on the offensive. His military genius had previously helped Babur defeat the Uzbeks in Central Asia. Now, his magical abilities would be required to secure the Mughal fortunes in the Indian subcontinent. The Mughal commander would take a detour while charging at the Lodi loyalists. 
This would help maintain the element of surprise. With no action in the morning, the Lodi loyalists were exhausted standing under the scorching sun for hours. They were probably looking to have some afternoon rest when disaster struck. They looked up and saw the Mughal horses charging towards them and just minutes away from making contact. The Lodi loyalists had little time to prepare for defense. They formed up to face the Mughal cavalry charge. The Bengali cavalry unit close to the Lodi loyalists had no time to wait for their Sultan's order. They rushed to the aid of Mahmud Lodi. However, not having the Sultan's order made them a bit confused, and that did not help their cause. Fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat raged as the Mughal charge struck the Lodi loyalists, and then the Bengali cavalry unit. The Lodi loyalists put up a gallant resistance, but they were no match for the hardiest mercenaries from Central Asia. The Bengali cavalry, in confusion, charged at their own allies, and that led to a terrible fiasco. The Lodi loyalists were nearly destroyed. With their Sultan Mahmud Lodi killed in action and several of their leaders succumbing to the Mughal charge, the unit was broken up. The Bengali cavalry suffered severe damage. The Mughal cavalry wished to strike at the Bengali center where the Sultan himself was positioned. But that was not an option due to the presence of the Bengali war elephants nearby. The Mughal cavalry charge, beg your pardon, the Mughal cavalry did take a few casualties, but their charge succeeded in its objective. They went back to their lines. The coalition army panicked at the end of Mahmud Lodi. The Bengali army was trying to install him on the throne of Delhi and his end dismissed the primary objective of this war. On the other side of the river, the Lohani-led Bihar army received information on the fall of the Lodi loyalists, in addition to the news that the Mughal war boats had reached the southern bank of the river and were transporting troops over. The Lohani army would now have to combat the Mughals directly. However, with Mahmud Lodi slain, they felt that they did not have a strong enough reason to fight. Even before a drop of Lohani blood was spilled, the Bihar army offered surrender to the Mughals. Babur happily accepted this peace proposal, and he put generous terms in the agreement.
As for the Bengal Sultan Nasrat Shah, he realized that he could not fight the Mughals alone without the help of the Bihar army. Hastily accepting the terms of surrender, the Bengali generals headed back towards the Bengali capital of Gaur in disappointment. It was a decisive victory for Babur. His possessions in North India were now secure. The differences between the Lohani and Lodi factions of the Pathan community proved detrimental to the Afghan national interests in the Indian subcontinent. As the Mughals would come out on top yet again. This time, unlike the earlier battles, it was a cavalry charge that turned the tide of the battle in their favor. The power of the Sultanate of Bengal was brought to a decline. Bengal promised to never again provide refuge to a political enemy of the Mughals. Sultan Nusrat Shah's prestige took a blow and soon after he had to suffer another reverse at the hands of the Ahom Kingdom, which is in modern-day Assam. The Sultanate of Bengal was further weakened upon the assassination of Nusrat Shah in 1533. Bihar was officially annexed by the Mughal Empire, but most of the Lohani leaders were retained in their former positions. They were very happy with the deal. Most importantly, all hopes for the restoration of the Lodi Empire ended with the Battle of Kagra. The Mughals had achieved a remarkable success in the Indian subcontinent in quick succession. Three major battle victories in three years is an amazing accomplishment. They look all set for the annexation of the entire subcontinent. The Mughal Empire controls vast swathes of land, stretching from Punjab in the west to Bihar in the east. Yet, there would be a twist in the tale. The lifelong toil of warfare would have an effect on Babur's health, and he would develop a fatal illness in the December of 1530. Babur's demise might create a huge political vacuum and the fate of his Indian empire looks far from certain. What would be the future of the Mughal Empire? You can find out by watching the next episode of this documentary series. Thank you for watching.